Go. All right, so I wanted to bring in the set of like basic tools. So I was asking like, well, what should I have when I start? What should, what would be recommended things? So I brought in kind of like a sample of some of the things here that I would, um, you know, what, what should you have showing up on the job? Basic things. So the first thing is, of course, your helmet. Everybody's got one, that's good. Um, kind of experience the last few days. It's always good to have a backup. So if you have a chance, just pick up an inexpensive um, old style fixed shade helmet, like a 10 or an 11 shade or something. Just have it around just in case, because if the sensor goes and they will, the battery fails, whatever, you know, it can be really inconvenient to have to like try and find a, a spare battery somewhere. And you can't do that on the job. You can't just leave your job and go do that. They may not have it in house. Good to have a spare that you can grab and go, okay, I can get back to work. Yeah, you may have to flip the helmet down and back up old style, but you should still be able to do it. So have a backup, very important thing. Okay, so um, the first thing is, of course, in what differentiates a fabricator from other things is your square. So having a good square is really a requirement and um, you know, it can't be like a carpenter square. I mean, you can't have something like the aluminum ones that carpenters use. Uh, aluminum, as you, as you know, it's too weak, it's not strong enough. It also melts, so well spattered hitting an aluminum square is gonna melt it. Also, the, the markings on sort of your average homeowner or carpenter square are stamped or they're painted on, they're not accurate enough. These are etched. So something like um, a starret like this one, the markings go down to 60 fourths and you can actually see them. So if you had to measure something to a 32nd of an inch, you could, and it's trusted, it, you can trust it. So remember, it's always about levels of trust. You know, we go back to you know, our datums on the print, you know, and our work table, our work surface, our level perfect work surface, it's all levels of trust from that point. So your square needs to be something that is absolutely trustworthy. So if somebody asks you, is, are you square? Is that, you know, six inches, is that six inches? You can say with confidence, yes it is. If somebody says, well, what kind of tool are you using? You know, what are you trusting with that? You can say, well, I'm using this one and something like a Starrett, why is this different from your average square you'd buy from anywhere else? It is guaranteed by the company who makes it to be accurate to a certain standard. I mean, this is traceable back to like, you know, the, the, the platinum meter bar in Washington, DC. It's traced, it's a traceable measuring device. Very important thing. Um, my first job I worked at in Connecticut, all of our squares, our tape measures had to be approved by the foreman of the shop. And he checked them against a known standard for accuracy. That way everybody in the shop, you know, all of us are working the same standard. If, if we're working on a big job together and one person is using some cheapo bargain basement square that's inaccurate, you can imagine what it does to everybody's work. You know, you know, nine of the 10 people are accurate that one person parts they make suddenly don't fit. And you're like, uh-oh, we're in trouble here because we're not working to the same standard. So um, traditionally, usually the first purchase of fabricators is your square. Your first paycheck usually goes to, part of it goes to buying, you know, buying your first square. Um, I've had the one I bought when I first started, it's at home, and I still use it. And this will last you the rest of your life and you can will this to your children or somebody else. So even though it's, it's you know, it'll be like, probably a hundred dollars or so, but it'll last you the rest of your life versus a cheaper one you may have to buy several times over. What use is that? So quality counts. Starrett's it's always a trustworthy brand in these tools and maybe others, but this is kind of the, the tool of record. So a good square. Another one would be um, a good tape measure. So of course, you know, any good metal body tape measure is recommended. Plastic ones will not last very long in a metalworking environment. Trust me, the first time you accidentally you're cutting with metal and you kind of move your torch a little too close, it's gonna melt. Or hot slag hits it, it's gonna melt. So a good one, um, you know, 25 footer, 20 footer is a really good one. 
funny as it sounds, I had a hundred foot one that wore out sadly, but I actually used it quite a bit while I was doing structural work. I bought a hundred foot one that enabled me to lay out like beams on a construction site. And that was very useful. They're a little hard to find, but it was actually pretty cool. So if you find yourself working on very large scale things, civil or shipbuilding, a 75 or 100 foot tape measure will be a, a tool used very, very often. So these two are a must. You, know, you show up to your first job, you should have a square and you should have a tape measure with you. Very important. Uh, the speed square is another really good one. These are not expensive. They're aluminum. So yeah, they're not that accurate. They're not intended to be. But for just quickly squaring up um, for jigs or stock for tacking, these are inval invaluable. Because it's aluminum, if, you, if you're tacking really close, you don't run the risk of actually welding this to the surface. So that's a plus because it's aluminum, because it's not that expensive, it's expendable. So if it gets really beat up, it's like, yeah, we should toss it. It's not a big deal. But these are incredibly useful. So a speed square is something that we use a lot in fabricating. Um, now we're gonna to get to say power tools. So this one is my personal um, grinder. This one I've used very, very heavily for ooh, 30 years. And I've replaced the brushes once. So does anybody know what the brushes are? Okay, so those of you who don't know what brushes are, um, electric motors use carbon brushes to transfer the electrical current to what's called the armature, the part that actually spins. And a lot of the power tools have had for a long time, they start working, you're like, oh, it's broken. No, no, it's not broken. You just need to replace the little brushes. You open up the body, you unscrew, it's a little carbon block with a spring on it. You pull them out, you put new ones in, close it back up, it runs again. So any kind of grinder, power, power tool, like a drill, they're all gonna have carbon brushes. A lot of people throw them away not realizing that's a couple bucks for new brushes. Why are you throwing away that tool? So I've replaced them once. This tool has been dropped in water. It's gone down to Virginia to do volunteer work with me and in mud. It's been through all kinds of abuse and um, it's never missed a beat. So it's a very, very powerful tool. I really like it. It's a Bosch. <coughs> And here are just some things about it I like. These are, these are some recommendations, okay? So one of the things about this is you notice it has a lock-on switch on the side. This doesn't have a paddle switch. So as a fabricator, a lot of us, you know, when we're looking at power tools and looking at grinders in particular, because this, like this is like your third hand. I mean, you use this all the time for all kinds of purposes. A paddle switch, if it's down here, you always have to grab it. So you're constantly putting pressure on it when you're working and imagine just keeping your fist closed for like eight hours. It becomes very fatiguing. So a lock on switch, I don't, I can relax my grip. I don't have to grab it so hard. But another thing is if I need to change my grip, you know, imagine like in sports, choking up on a bat or adjusting your grip on a paddle or something. If you can't adjust your grip, it really limits your mobility. And then you're, and if you have to change direction, like you're out of position. If, I, if my hand is always locked on the paddle, it's very awkward to move around, but here I can move around anywhere I need to without worrying about the tool shutting off or having to keep my hand on there. Of course, what it means is this is a professional tool. When the switch is on, the machine is on. So of course you don't put it down, you know? You're aware of that. Um, the paddle switches again are going to sort of like making tools safe for amateurs. We're professionals. So if you seek them out, they still make these things so they don't advertise them that much. But this is my preference. Also the handle, we notice this handle, I can switch it from left to right side as well, um, over here. So of course this can be lefty or righty, but sometimes you do this anyway because it affords you a, a, an alternate grip for different usages. Some better models will have an additional one right here where you can attach it on there. Those are really good. You can find one that has an additional mounting point on the top of the head. Those are really nice. Reason is, um, you can uh, do things like this. Again, 
you know, having a grip like that and a lock on, you know, I can do things like here, where what if I wanna, I have to cut metal or I need to groove something out, I can hold it like this, brace this against my forearm, and now I can just go through really easy. I can't do that if I have to grip a paddle switch at the same time, I can't do that. But here I can. So it enables me things like that, slicing metal really accurately, grooving something out, uh, grinding. So those are very nice features. Now the guard, um, I keep my guards on. This is, can be a bone of contention with some people. Um, I keep it on, I've been doing this for a long time. I keep it on because I have been injured by machines that didn't have guards on. And I mean, I can't pull the clothes off to show you, but I have a three inch gash on the inside of this knee from a grinder. You know, I was working out of position, the machine skipped and you know, what they call a, you know, uh, almost like a chainsaw, they tend to do that. Kick, kick back. The kick back went right into my knee. So it's about, I lost about this much flesh on my knee. And the worst one was using a, using a grinder where again, kick back and it plunged into my chest. And um, that was one of the most serious injuries. And it happened so quickly that the blood didn't even flow. And I'm looking down and it actually ripped the shirt, like one of these jackets, ripped it off my body and I had no clothes on my upper body. It ripped it off my body, it was that violent. And it dug right here, it's right here on my chest. And when I went to the hospital, the doctor said, he was like, if it had been like a, a fraction of an inch deeper, it's like, I would have been in the ER. So it would have hit into the, um, the enclosure around my heart. <sighs> and it would have been like, it could have been like fatal. It was really bad. So. Guards are a good idea, okay? Because we think that, oh, it's never gonna happen to me, but the thing is it always does when we least expect it. So I keep it on. Another thing is it gives us confidence in the tool. If I'm cutting like this, if I have no guard on here, do I want my face over here? No way. But if I have the guard, here, so yeah, nothing's gonna hit me in the face. I have confidence in the tool. I can get really close. I can really get in there with confidence. I'm not always like, mm, I'm not flinching because I'm not worried about that. Now I say, oh, the guard gets in your way. Well, people, that's why you can rotate the guard. You can rotate the guard to any position to allow you access to whatever you need to do. So keep it on. We all like our faces. Um, material coming off of here comes off very violently. Okay, this spins at 20,000 RPM. Things like this, you know, a resin disc, a small fragment of resin disc coming off of here at 20,000 RPM will leave you a very significant bruise. So a resin disc, um, this is a very useful tool and uh, use these a lot in metalworking industry, not so much here because of the safety issues, but a resin disc mounts on a um, backing like this, you put it on, and this will allow you, especially for sanding, and think of things like what we've done with TIG welding, with like the um, like sanding and smoothing surfaces. This will allow you access to grits up to like 120 grit sandpaper. So you can sand extremely smooth surfaces with a pad like this. Um, you can buy these at any store. They're not expensive. They're like a you know, whole kit, maybe nine or $10. So they're very good to have. And many shops, these are the discs they use for metalworking. They can go with like 40 grit up to 120. And occasionally, if you're lucky, you can find 220 grit, which is amazing for stainless steel. So this is a, a rubber backing pad. Other tools, which I have, um, this is not required. I just brought this in because it's cool. This is the absolutely the most lethal tool in my, oh, in my arsenal. Yeah. Yeah, this is the absolutely most dangerous tool I own. Um, this is a chainsaw wheel. So this mounts on the grinder, enabling you to carve wood like it wasn't even there. Um, again, if you imagine the kickback issues with a grinder, this is, you wanna use the guard with a tool like this. Mm. Yeah, you know what a chainsaw can do. Now have one operating at 20,000 RPM. Um, it's a very cool tool. You can carve wood, like just think and you go right through it. It's quite beautiful, but very dangerous. 
very cool. So a grinder is a must. Now, how much is it going to cost you? Um, you don't want to cheap out on these things, okay? One of the things is, if you notice the arbor here, this is a um, 5 8 11 arbor. Sometimes you may see ones that use a quarter inch arbor. Do not buy those. Those are kind of, they're not strong enough. Those are amateurish ones. You want a 5 8 11 arbor because all the standard tooling fits this arbor. So if you're in a shop, everything that mounts onto it is going to mount to a 5 8 11. Um, yeah, and it get and just just feel, make sure that it fits you well, that it's comfortable, it fits your hands. Some of the newer ones have anti-vibration handles, which are really nice. Um, this is old. This is a very 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 old one. Um, it was old when I got it, but it still works. So you know, get the best you can for the money you've got. You know, because this will serve you very 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 well. So this kind of like quartet, or even like trio of tools right here, is kind of like your basic kit. You know, these three will serve you for like the first few years very, very, very well. Um, additional things that I think are really useful um, that I used right here is silly enough, but a calculator. Um, this is actually the same calculator I used as a fabricator like over 25 years ago. It still works. No batteries. You see that? It's solar. So um, I'm never running. I never had to run for batteries. I never had to like, oh my God, it's running out of power. Does anybody have a button cell for this thing? It always works. No matter what you pull it out, it always works. The reason I have this here is because there are many conditions where you maybe you don't want to pull your phone out. Um, because of like, you know, you, your phone is a little bit more valuable than this. If it gets weld spatter on it. I mean, I had a student in the night who was filming, wanted to film what she was welding. And she looks, she goes, <gasps> she had weld spatter hit the screen and it just melted into the glass. And she was like, ah, and I said, well, that's why we gotta be careful about this kind of stuff. So <laughs> if you need to do calculations, which you will, you know, measuring, adding, dividing, subtracting, whatever, a cheap, inexpensive solar calculator is a really good thing to just have because maybe you want to pull the phone out. Also, depending on the industry you're in, if you're working electric boats, Pratt & Whitney, any defense contractor related industry, you're not going to be able to have your phone on the shop floor. You have to keep it locked in your locker. An electric boat actually requires employees to deactivate the video function on their phones, on employment. So you want to make sure, so that's something you want to consider. So here I can do my measurements. I can do my adding, subtracting of my print material really easily. And as you can see, 25 years later, it hasn't missed a beat. I don't think your phone is going to have that same track record. So it's actually a really nice thing, inexpensive insurance. A good hammer. So I've got kind of like, a couple here. So um, this is a ball peen hammer. So this is kind of one of my favorite ones. A nice small ball peen hammer. Um, this is not used for this is not used for whacking on chisels. This is used for just you know adjusting things and carefully moving things. Like maybe um, center punching holes. You know, prick punching things. It's not an, it's not a tool for whaling on. Where something like this is. So something like that, which is called an engineer's hammer. Um, this is designed for, you know, really, if you have to move metal, this will do it. And this is designed for it, for that kind of use. So I've got something like that, which is a very old um, ball peen hammer. And one of the notable things on here is, if you notice the chip on there, does everybody see that? That chip right there? Hammers are actually hardened for different uses. so. This face is, is hardened. It's a hardened face versus this one, which is much softer, like a sledgehammer. So this is designed for metal to metal contact with, with great violence. This is not, this, even though this is heavy, I don't hold it here, I actually hold it up here. This is for, you know, moving, adjusting jigs or something. It's got mass, but it's not for whaling on. That chip is because somebody did this. They hit really hard and that hardened chip came flying off and when it flies off it comes off with the velocity of a small you know a small round and it can go into you so it's something to be aware of you do not hit metal on metal with ball peen hammers it's dangerous and don't do it okay you see people doing it duck 
you know, not safe. So hammers, a good comfortable hammer. I mean, a hammer is your friend. Find one that fits your hands the right weight. Not too heavy, but not too light. So you want to find something that's comfortable and that you can you can work with comfortably and safely. So hunt around, look at the stores and pick up different ones. So you find the one you go, oh, okay, this is it. This is my hammer. You know, hunt around and be choosy, you know? Find something that fits you. This I got in an, an antique store, by the way. Um, this is, uh, it actually says RRR division, railroad division. That's cool. Yeah, so I don't know how old this is, but I suspect this is probably over a hundred years old. I mean, when's the last time that hammers were building railroads? You know, so I got an antique store, but you know what? It works beautifully. I love it. It's a beautiful, has a great weight to it. It feels just right, and it makes all the difference. A good chisel. Um, these these things can be quite hard to find. So a good chisel is something you definitely want in your toolbox because it enables you a couple of things. You can take the heads off of bolts that are, are frozen in place. You can cut stock. A good chisel, you should be able to cut eighth inch steel in a vise easily with a chisel. You should be able to do that. And it should, the edge should hold. So if you have to cut metal, you can do it. If you have to you know, move spatter from a surface or what have you, a good chisel. So hunt around, find one that's you know, fairly substantial. You know, this is, it was an inch, is a one inch chisel. Um, and that this is made in Utica, United States. The quality of chisels in the last few years is quite questionable. So, um, you know, if you find one, if you, you know, hit it and you notice the edge dents, no good, I take it back. You wanna make sure that a chisel, a cold chisel like this, should be able to cut mild steel without the edge denting whatsoever. So make sure of that, okay? It's called a cold chisel because it's designed to cut metal cold. A hot chisel is what a blacksmith uses. A hot chisel is for cutting hot metal. We don't use them, but it's, we use a cold chisel. That's, what, that's where it comes from. Um, when I bought this, the advertisement that they had for this thing was one of these chisels, as in the store, one of these chisels and I think it was a one inch plate of steel and they had taken a press and they had punched it through a one inch plate of steel. <clears throat> Made to show just how hard this thing is, how durable it is. And it was like sunk through, punching through the other side. Like that's a chisel I want. It was about $30 back then. Um, yeah, they are expensive, but you know what? It could save you, it could, it'll earn its keep. You know, it'll earn its keep. So a good chisel, definitely something to hunt around for. Look for used ones, antique stores, yard sales. Old metal is gonna be better, all right? It's gonna be better. You know, so look for old things like that. Do you ever have to sharpen that? Yes, you know, definitely. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you have to sharpen this, yes, from time to time, of course. And the better chisels are easier to resharpen. The metal, the metal is better to resharpen. Do you use like, would you use the same like stones that you would for sharpening like knives or? Um, that? I mean, you you can if you need. I mean, it depends on the edge you need on the thing. I mean, just rub, just a quick sharpen on a grinding wheel is fine. Um, it doesn't need to be knife sharp because you're not cutting like paper or something. You're cutting metal, so the edges are actually not as extreme. But if you needed to, yeah, you could. You could stone sharp if you want to do. I mean, that would become overkill, but you could, definitely. Uh, next, um, good pliers. These are not good pliers. These are huskies. These are not good pliers. Um, these are another tool, again, where you're gonna be spending probably 30 or more uh, because one of the <coughs> things here is you want to find pliers that can cut wire and not dull. That's something all of us have experienced in the lab. You're trying to cut TIG wire and MIG wire and you're like, <laughs> and it doesn't cut. MIG wire is, and welding wire is extremely hard. So it really does a number on cutting tools. It's very hard stuff, especially MIG wire, flux core. It's, it ruins pliers. So you gotta make sure you find ones that are of quality where the jaws are like, are serious, they're hardened. These are actual cutting jaws. So something like Klein, a company like that, that makes like lineman's tools for actually for cutting wire, 
they're and they're they're not cheap. If you look, they have a special display in a lot of home stores. You see, their tools are premium tools. They are because they're good. So you want to find pliers that um, are tough enough where yeah, you can pull wire out if you have to undo things on a MIG gun. That the cutting jaws are are the real deal. So hunt around. I mean, I'm still trying to find for myself a pair that are actually satisfactory. I'm still looking. Um, I got these because they happen to be laying around to the shop at home and I grabbed them. But good pliers, not necessary in the beginning, but you know what? The pliers are gonna have in the shop will be like, you know, the ones everybody's used and nobody wants to use. And you're like, I don't use those things. They're all beat up and rusty and horrible. Yeah, they're just, they're the worst. So those are good. Uh, a punch, a good punch. Uh, just like the chisel, it's got to be made out of good quality steel, you know, good quality tool steel. You can resharpen it easily. Um, so um, find, you know, find ones that are, find one that's, you know, half inch is a good size. Um, I have a, I, if you've seen the giant one they have that's like two inches in diameter, the really, really big one I used when I was doing um, structural steel. A good, a good center punch for marking your holes for drilling, um, marking measurements out, a very, very good thing to have, a good center punch. Again, look through used sources. You'll find some nice ones. So the rest of you are other additional things that, that I like. Um, I like these things, little pry bars like this. This is called a cat's paw. This is primarily a carpenter's tool. Um, its origins are actually Japanese originally, um, but you can buy them all over the place now. Um, also, just like uh, what they call um, something bars, what do they call those? Uh, they're like the short bars like this. Wrecking Crow. bars? Yeah, like, short, like a short wrecking bar. They're very useful because wrecking some, bar. let's say you've got to move something. You know, you've got like, you're like lining something up, oh, I need to go like another eighth of an inch. And it lets you multiply your force so you can just move things just a little bit if you have to. Or let's say metal's warped, you can jam it in there, push, and then tack something down. So it gives you a little extra force. A cat's paw like this is really great if you have to get into like, say two pieces butted up together and you're like, I can't get anything in there and I need to like move it a little bit. Um, this lets you get into a tiny gap. You can move it or maybe get a, maybe your partner to, hey, lean on that while I tack it. So we actually used to have two of these things. We used to use two because you could jam it into a seam and I could go like this, I could say, you know, I could push a seam open, jam the other one in, walk along, and I could keep kind of walking along a seam if I had to move a piece, and then my partner would come behind me, you know, and tack things in place. So the two levers would let me move things if I had to adjust stuff. Very useful for sheet metal, really, really useful for thin stuff. So these are inexpensive. A pair of these can go a long way to like multiplying your abilities in a big way. So cat's paws, small wrecking bars, wonderful. Um, good files, you know, these you just pick up along the way. I've got a round file right here, a square file. I've got this really beautiful one, which is kind of like a leaf shape, half round. Really cool, because this lets me get inside pipes. So I can do the inside of a pipe or a contoured form. The square one lets me do the inside of a square edge very easily. The round one's kind of your all around round file. So, you know, a good, you pick these up as you go. These are rusty, but they're still very good. Again, files are another tool that have come down in quality in a big way in recent decades. So old ones are gonna be superior. Just because it's a little rusty, it can be brought back very easily with some like rust remover, um, a wire, good wire brushing. So, these are kind of things, and these are ancient. These are very, very, very old, as you can see, but still very good. Um, a good file, again, is gonna be like $30 and up. I have some files at home that are this big, which are probably $100 a piece when they're new. Um, but they're good things to have, and they'll serve you very well for things like, you know, the TIG cube or small forms, where you're like, okay, I really need to put a nice edge on here. So files. You know, a couple of adjustable wrenches, you know, a little tiny one, a bigger one, because in the shop, these things inevitably always go walking. You're like, does anybody know where the wrench is? And you're like, you know, you're walking around the shop, nobody knows where the wrench is. Somebody put it in their back pocket and went home, you know, 
the things that it's like you, you waste more time looking for it, just buy one. So little wrenches are great for, you know, just things you gotta tighten, things you gotta do, moving things. Again, using the, using the back end, you gotta bend something really quick, very useful. I've got my favorite one at home is a giant one like this, about this long, like a 16 inch handle, which is a really nice size, by the way. A really big one is just is great. This is my all around absolutely favorite file. This is my favorite one. This is my favorite file. It's got my favorite handle on it. This is my favorite one. Why? Because it's got a very special feature. Many of you may not know about this. This is called a safe edge file. Does anybody know what that is? No. Okay, this is something that has been lost to the dustbin of history in metalworking. A safe edge file, one edge of this file has no teeth on it at all. Now you can make one, and I've done that in the lab. One of the files you see, I actually ground off the edge. You can do that by a file, you grind off the edge so there's no teeth on, smooth it. With this, this lets you do something very special, which is, um, I can say if I wanna file this surface down here, but I don't wanna damage this one, okay? I can put it up against this edge. I can file with no fear I'm going to like grind into this edge. So it's called a safe edge file. People years ago, metal workers used to use these. You know, if I'm doing like a square hole and I wanna get the corner of a square hole, it enables me to very precisely file without like <clears throat> grinding, oh crap, I ground into the side. Now I have to redo my work. So a safe edge file is a really good thing to have. Just mm -hmm. buy a file, grind one edge and file and sand it smooth. And now you can get very precise filing with confidence you know if you're not confident with a tool you can't use the tool you know think of the dog analogy if you're afraid of the dog it knows you can't handle an animal if you're afraid of it you can't handle a power tool or a hand tool if you're afraid of the tool if you're worried it's going to bite you so you want to make sure that you have tools that enable what you need to do with confidence so a safe edge file a lot of people don't know that anymore but i'm telling you because it's a secret that is a great way to doing some really nice work and impressing people. Fine work. So this is one of my favorites. I've had this for many decades and it's never let me down. So my favorite ones, it's a square, nice square file. Very precise, it's really comfortable to use. Handles. A lot of people use files without handles. Um, get handles, okay, because it's just, a, it's a good idea. It's very, it's very easy to have things like this happen, where you're filing and the tang goes into your wrist or somebody bumps you and this goes into your gut. Um, so handles are not good, plus you get much better grip. So these can be bought separately. You can buy bags of these things. Files are really good. An adjustable pipe wrench. Not necessary, but a nice thing because this enables you to do pipes, you can undo pipes and connections, you can rotate pipes if you're welding them, clamp it on and rotate, you know, you weld, you rotate, um, bend things if you have to. Uh, this one this one is another tool I got from like a yard sale. It's unknown how old this thing is. It's from Western Auto Supply. Yeah, I, I don't know where that, I have no idea where that shop came from or it's even in existence anymore. But it's a really good tool. So a little thing like this is a very nice, again, another additional tool for get, rotating the edge of a plate if you have, like a beam, we use it for beams, like I-beams, put on the edge of a beam, now I have a lever where I can rotate a beam over to get the other side. Boom, boom, I don't have to ask somebody, hey, can you help me rotate this thing? I can do it myself. So very useful. And last but not least, half clamp. So again, if you have a clamp, that is broken or in a shop where they always torque them to kingdom come, don't throw it away. Grab the clamp, you cut it and weld on a pad. And this becomes one of the most useful tools in all fabrication because now you can tackle it to a surface. You can hold down something here. I can do it on a wall. I can do it upside down anywhere I need to. I have an additional clamp I can install anywhere I need to work it. So it's a very useful tool. Um, Fabricators usually have two. 
So when we were working, we always had piles of these things that we made for special purposes. Very useful. I've had this one for, I honestly can't even remember how old this thing is. But I had this, I think I made this my first, the first shop I worked at. I've changed the base several times because it's worn out. But this part itself, as you can see, look how torqued that, that uh, mm -hmm. see, somebody was very mean to it. So you can see this was a goner, but it's become a very useful hand tool. What was garbage now becomes an essential tool. And that's really one of the basic things for what we do. Recycling what other people see as trash is no, it is a very useful thing. You're just looking at the wrong way. You know, you're looking at the wrong way. This has a new life. So this kind of, these are my, my tools that I, whenever I go on a field job or somebody's house, this is what I take with me and this is what always, this is what I use to back up my work right here. Of course, in addition to welder, but this is like my hand tool selection. This works. This can get you through just about anything with the addition of something like, um, uh, you know, a scribe like this, a carbide scribe, a Sharpie, you're good to go. So that's the tool selection right here. Um, hope this helps. You kind of see, kind of equip yourselves when you're ready to go. And uh, there you are. So if you want to come take a look, you can and kind of touch them, handle them, what you want. There you go. All right, can you hit that to record? See you stop thing.